All right. Uh, I am Dr. Kim Godwin. I am an instructional designer in MTSU Online. And um, we are here today to talk a little bit about um, groups. And I was like, wow, uh, I'm looking right at it. And it's still the word is not. Um, we're here to talk about groups, but specifically talk about groups in D2L and how those groups in D2L um, best work for you if you have large enrollment classes. Um, there are so many millions of things that we can do in D2L uh, with all of the different tools, but one of them that we may not be utilizing to its fullest is that groups tool and how we can use that to manage. Um, you know, we say over here, um, I'm not sure how far our say goes other than it's just our opinion and we think it's right. Um, is it an online class that is an undergraduate class probably doesn't need more than about 25 people in it um, for it to really be at the optimum for student engagement and your engagement with the students. We are fully aware that our, <laughs> right, yay. Uh, we are fully aware that our opinion probably stops with us. Um, and that it ultimately comes down to what departments, deans, and others make decisions about in terms of the size of a course. Um, so thinking about that, 25 is probably the upper end of what is easily managed with the best practices in online learning that people have been talking about for years and years and years and how to use discussion boards or how to create engagement or different things like that. Um, not a lot of our classes fit in that gamut anymore. So we wanted to take this opportunity to kind of provide you some tools and things to think about how you can create that within your courses that are 30, 50. I hear horror stories of ones that are 80 and 90 and even larger. Um, and those hurt my soul, but I, I know that they exist. And so we want to try to make the experience a little bit better for faculty and for the students because um, the student experience is where we're trying to go with these things, but you as faculty members need to know how to better maintain and manage that experience for your students without losing all that is left that you have left after being in COVID for two years. Um, so really figuring out the best way to manage yourself and, and things like that. So um, hit some screen share so I can show you our little presentation. And then we're going to talk through some stuff and, and really talk about things. And as I'm doing this, um, don't forget to check out the calendar for some of the upcoming workshops and stuff. Um, the LT and ITC has some amazing workshops coming up. There's some faculty book groups that I am sure are full because they fill one second after those emails come out, but check them out because they are very good at, if you make it onto the wait list, um, if there's a big enough group, they'll do it again. Um, so it's a really great experience and opportunity if you haven't done one of those. Uh, and it also kind of models some behavior for future group activities. Um, and then uh, MTSU Online has one coming up, I think it's next week, on H5P, um, which is, um, that is HTML5. That's all that means. Um, that's all, it's just that it's the fifth iteration of HTML programming and communication. Um, but it's a pretty awesome, engaging activity. So y'all should check that out. Um, okay, so I am going to try to share my screen and hope that it goes fantastic. Uh, and we'll see how it goes. Look, there's my screen. Um, now I'm going to try to get the presentation to switch over. Um, maybe, maybe we can get it to do it. Hey, screen. Hey. I know, talking to myself, right? It's part of the fun. Okay, so Oops, we're seeing, we're seeing, there we go. We there should be able to see it now, right? Okay, so um, as we get started on this too, this is, um, those of you that know me know that I'm not necessarily pro PowerPoint um, because I think sometimes we spend more time on the PowerPoint than we do on the course conversations and, and talking to our students. Um, and they seem too structured and a little boring for me. That's just me. That's a Kim Godwin issue. Um, but I know that it's good for us to have a little bit and it sometimes keeps us on track because uh, those of you who, who may not know this about me, these are where my presentations start um, and sometimes where they end. Um, so um, I try to do a little bit to keep y'all informed of where I'm going with things um, and give you something to follow through 
with later. Um, so here's my little PowerPoint on this one to keep us on track and talk a little bit about what it is that we're going to cover today. Um, but I am doing this much more in the, as we talk about the topics, I'm going to talk about them. And then after we get done, I will go into how to actually do the things on D2L. So this one's structured just a little bit different than I sometimes do. Um, and as always, uh, we have Karen Hine, who is here as our one of our other instructional designers, and she's monitoring the chat. So if you have a question and I sail past it, please make sure to ask it in the chat and we will definitely get to it. Uh, so today we're talking about groups in D2L and the benefits to faculty. So here are our topics. So the first one that we're going to talk about a little bit is creating community. So you hear this a lot um, when talking to anybody who is in any level of education. It doesn't matter if it's online or in a face-to-face -face classroom or any iteration in between those two. Um, the community that we create with our students is so vital. It's, it's us with the students. It's the content with the students and it's student to student. Um, and sometimes, especially in large classes, uh, we run into um, a struggle with creating community. If there are 80 people in our class, um, it, that's almost impossible to create a community unless you're very intentional about how you break that up. So to meet that community of inquiry concept of, with us, the student with us, the student with the content and the student with other students, we have to create that environment. When you are in a class that you're teaching and you have a discussion board set up and you have put that in place for them to talk about topic um, and then 80 people post a 200 word initial post and then those 80 people then post two more anywhere between 50 and 150 response, you have 90 million, I don't think that's the exact number, but that's probably what it feels like, 90 million posts that you have to read in your class. And it probably creates feelings for you, um, all kinds of feelings. Hopefully you're not having those feelings right now, just talking about it. But if you are, it's okay. We're here to talk about how to be better. Um, so if you feel that way, Imagine how your students feel too. They don't know anybody in this class. They're just learning the concepts and topics. And there are 79 other people that are saying things. So when they log in to do their post, they see this never ending scroll, 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 scroll of all these other people who have said things. How do they even begin? Who do they pick to be the person that they review what they wrote and respond back to? Um, or if you're somebody that says, hey, you have to read a certain percentage or you need to have read them all. Um, reading all when there are 80 in the class, that's a lot. That's when we have to stop and step back and think a little bit about our students' cognitive load. We have to think about our cognitive load. We have to think about their workload and what that looks like. Um, because if you're reading 80 people's posts, um, that is way more than what we're looking at in terms of getting to the 135 hours that is the overall instruction for a three hour class, um, because it, it takes you a lifetime, um, or as Tara likes to say, 50 forevers, to get to that point of reading all of them. So it overwhelms our students, it overwhelms us, how do we look at that and create that community that isn't quite so overwhelming? And one of the ways to do that is to do groups. Um, and so I will, uh, later on, I'll actually show you how to set these up. And then I'll also show you how to do the grading, which I see Dave is in there. And so at some point um, we'll discuss whether or not you got yours to work. Cause I think I might've left a step out. Sorry. Um, so we will definitely talk about how to group grade discussions as well um, so that it is one grade for a group but creating those groups within your discussion boards creates a smaller community for your class um, they will be in so if you have 80 people in your class I mean that easily I would knock that down so that you had 15 to 20 per group and maybe even smaller than that um, it wouldn't be the end of it if you were like 10 people per group, um, because those 10 people can then have a very good 
conversation with each other. They don't get overwhelmed. It's only 10 people that they're looking at. Um, it's not 80 people that they're trying to pick two or three. It's 10. Then you really can have the expectation of read what everybody had to say. Really engage with those 10 people. Um, respond to those 10 people. And it keeps that for them in a much more manageable size. Now for you, depending on how you set it up, that that is still 80 that you're having to grade. So that kind of leads me a little bit into our next one. Um, and I ask, why are we grading? And what are the alternatives? And um, I'm, there's a book group, I think, on, on grading right now. So uh, if you happen to be in, in that, great. Um, if not, it's okay. And this is not really um, a presentation to talk about grading or ungrading. It's more about why are we doing um, group discussions or why are we doing discussions in the same manner that um, a best practice says for a class that's 20 to 25 if our class is 80. Why are we grading that way? Are we grading that way because that's how we've always graded? Um, are we grading that way because that's how we were taught? Are we grading that way because an instructional designer at some point was like, hey, grade like this. Um, are we grading that way because the, the templates that, that MTSU Online gives you has that required discussion model forum description uh, and it actually talks about 200 words and 100 to 150 words, which is again, a template. It's, it's not like the, it's not the word. It wasn't etched in stone. Um, so it is meant to be edited. It is just an example. Um, so why are we grading our discussions? Are we looking at these discussions um, as an opportunity for our students to create community, engage with each other, and really have conversations about the material? Or are we looking at this in order to have something in our gradebook? Um, are we putting a grade on it because we're afraid our students won't engage if there's not a grade? Um, are we thinking about discussions in terms of, is it a formative assessment or is it a summative assessment? Is it something that we want in a discussion to really understand um, that they have all of the information that they need on this topic? Or are we looking for them more to engage with themselves and with each other in terms of conversation and processing of information? Um, so, and I know I'm talking a little bit heavily about discussions here at first. I'm gonna talk about some other stuff here in just a second. Um, but kind of as you're sitting here thinking about things and I'm asking these questions, I want you to kind of think about why you do the discussions the way that you do. Because I hear a lot of people with large course enrollments that discussion is the thing that causes them the most stress and anxiety. Discussion is the thing that takes up the most time. Discussion is the thing that is kind of exhausting for them. So if we're looking at it in terms of, are we grading it or aren't we grading it? Maybe think about, and this is where those tips and tricks and things that Kim's like, hey, make note of this, maybe we can try this. Um, what about if our discussions, instead of it being a, grade per discussion, it'd be more of a grade per group. Um, and so whether that's grading the actual inter engagement of the group discussion and everybody gets the same grade, or it's that you let them or you encourage them to, to really engage with each other and talk and it not have specific word counts, um, but it really have prompts that encourage them to communicate with each other. Um, you could within that assign roles so then in any given module, um, different people within the group are different roles. So you could have a moderator that is a student that speaks up first and, and asks a first question or is the first to respond to a question that you prompted um, or that there's people that their job for that module is to continue responding to other people or um, create a summary or any of those things. And we have some some resources and stuff that we can share if you're kind of curious about how to set some roles up within that. Um, so if you're looking for something more like a, a book discussion or um, a group case study discussion or something like that, that you want people to have roles, we can send them to you. 
Um, or it can be very, uh, I mean, I don't really even know the best word, but something that's much more um, lively, um, not as scripted, not as structured, that students are able to really talk to each other in those smaller discussion boards about concepts and about information and about what they see in it, instead of being worried about 200 words, APA citations, connections with the reading and or resources, um, your response being at least this many words, and it can't be, hey, great job, I like what you said, and then repeating what that person said, but actually modeling the behavior of recreating a little bit closer to what you have in a face-to-face -face classroom. Now, one of the things that I usually get a little bit pushback on this one is, well, what if they don't participate? Okay. Um, they may not. In your face-to-face -face classes, does every student participate at the same level? Probably not. Um, and if they don't, does that impact their overall grade? Um, if they're there, but they're not necessarily engaging at the full level as someone else, does it necessarily impact their grade? How do you grade discussions in your face-to-face -face class? And how does that impact how you would grade in an online class? How is that different? Um, are you allowing your students to choose not to participate in activity? We, we have to give them the choice to not be successful, which is so against everything that I do because I'm always like, oh my gosh, I want everybody to be amazing uh, and really get everything out of this because I'm passionate about the topic or I'm passionate about what I'm doing. But sometimes we have to let them not be engaged because that is the choice that they are making in their own learning. Um, and that is hard. Um, so that is kind of where you run into some issues with if everybody's getting the same group grade on a discussion, then you can run into some problems with that. Um, if you aren't making everyone participate. Um, but again, how can you make somebody do something they really are just not engaged in doing? Uh, and what does that grade look like? And how are we doing that? So maybe not having traditional assessment grades set with discussions is one of the ways that we can get around that. Um, another way to do it is to actually have your groups be able to complete peer evaluations on each other. Uh, and you use those evaluations to um, assess their grade in discussions. Um, that also pulls over into if you are going to be doing things like group presentations um, or group work of any kind, it's really important to tie that peer evaluation to their activity. We have, um, we have some peer assessment forms, and then we actually have some rubrics that we can give you all that are built into D2L that we can share with you um, about what some of those things look like and how you can do some peer assessments. And then you can actually tie the grades to the peer assessments as opposed to the actual discussion board itself um, or actual group grade itself, if you are thinking about doing stuff like that. Um, so I've mentioned in, in this conversation a little bit about smaller groups, maybe not traditional grading and assessment, using a little bit of peer evaluation. Uh, I also covered book groups a little bit, um, things about case studies and roles that individuals can play within the different activities. Um, one of the concepts within that that I kind of wanted to bring up is um, in some of the classes that, that I teach, um, I have group presentations. I hear a lot that you can't do those in online, but you absolutely can. Um, and it's okay uh, to have those expectations for students to do presentations, um, for students to have group work, um, and, because they're going to figure out a way to meet with each other exactly the same way they do in the face-to-face -face environment, but it's their choice when, it's their choice how, and it's how they then create whatever it is that they're creating as a part of that project or presentation. Um, in today's world, um, you know, if we're connecting to uh, what they're going to be doing in their communities, what they're going to be doing uh, within their careers, what they're going to be doing in life, a whole lot of things out there are virtual now. Um, and so if we are teaching our students the skills on how to do some of those presentations and group projects in a virtual environment, not only are they 
applying the information from our class and creating ways of synthesizing that information and presenting it, they're also learning that skill that they're going to take forward into their career, uh, which is huge because I know we talk about that a lot with MT Engage and experiential learning and authentic assessments and all of those things. If we can make those connections to things outside of just the classroom into their normal lives outside of school, then we are adding to our learning and creating a greater global learner. Um, so those are just a few. Um, there's lots of other ways that we could probably talk about. I could talk about examples for hours. Um, so if, if anybody has some or needs some, please let me know. Um, we'll go on to the next topic here in just a second, but I know there's some stuff going on in chat. Are there any questions? Or are there any things that I haven't answered or that we haven't been able to get to yet? We doing okay? I think we're doing okay. The question has kind of come up again about sort of tw going towards that grading and um, what you're really looking for. What are mm -hmm. you expecting um, of you know a group project or a group interaction? And that I, Kim Sadler brought up, you know, should we not grade? Uh, should we give? Does that mean no grade for non-participators? And again, I think that goes back to what are you looking for? What are you expecting? Those kinds of things. But Kim may be able to say more to that. Uh, for me, within that part of it, from when I am doing group projects and presentations and group work, um, there's always a group grade. Um, and then there is always a peer assessment um, grade that goes with it that is a separate standalone grade and that is super important to me because I, I need students to understand the level that I value that to not only the level of um, their participation in the learning opportunity but how they work with and engage with each other and the opinions and uh, input of classmates um, because the peer assessment is really huge um, in terms of group presentations and group projects. And a lot of that does come down to when students freak out because they have to do a group project because they don't want to do it all by themselves. Well, in reality, if you have a peer assessment situation, the person who's doing all of it um, actually tends to get as poor a grade as the person that didn't do any because the majority of individuals feel like they weren't able to contribute um, and so you, you actually get to have slightly different conversations about that in terms of our roles and what that looks like and communication and engagement um, and things like that. So for me, I think it's, it, it's really important to have both of those components and to be very clear up front about what those, those are. Um, and then that goes back again um, for discussions, especially in larger groups are they something that needs to have a grade? And by grade, I mean, does it need to have, this is worth this percentage of your final grade? Or is it that if your group had some active participation and engagement, everybody gets a point or everybody gets two points. And it's not necessarily gonna overall impact the grade in the class, uh, maybe counted as bonus, maybe, only assess it twice a semester, like once at midterm and once at the end of the semester, and they get a grade based on how they did throughout the entire time, um, either based off of your review or off of their peer review of engagement, um, that you, instead of every single module um, looking at that and grading it every single time, is there a way that we can assess that participation and that engagement in a, a much broader entity? Um, one of those things, too, is um, best practices will tell you that it's good for you as a faculty member to participate in discussions. It is. Um, if you, however, have 80 people in your class, that's almost impossible for you to respond to each um, within any given week. It's almost impossible to respond to everybody within the semester. Um, so some of the ways to look at that are instead of doing in the discussion board, um, especially if you have the whole class, instead of doing the in the discussion board um, comments with individual students, kind of review and keep up with it and do a post um, on announcements or even another post within discussions. If you're doing it within groups, it is really important that you do actually create something 
probably within the discussion board or as an announcement that shows that you are reviewing what people are doing. Maybe you post once per group. That's like, hey, 11, this conversation, it made me think of this and kind of post in a question. But if you have 80 people and you have 10 people in your class, that's eight times that you're posting. Um, it's not 80 times that you're posting. It's eight and you're hitting all 80 of your students and they're seeing you. So you're still in that engagement and you're still in there creating that community and setting up that opportunity for them to connect to you, but you're not spending every minute of your day creating and reading discussions. So it really kind of helps you process your time just a little bit more. I don't know that I actually yeah. answered your question, Kim, but I hope, I hope that helps some. <laughs> Kim, this yeah. is uh, Mark Jackson. Sure. Yeah, I uh, the first semester I was online, I assessed everybody's D2L discussion. And you know, I added up all the, the commentary I made that first semester, and it was over 100,000 words. Mm -hmm. I was beating myself to death, and I thought, and it also, even though people did well in most of the assessments, they were resentful mm -hmm. that I was assessing them in their discussion. So I stopped doing that. I, I listened to their comments. And so now it, I, I say it's a no judgment zone. They have to like, they have to post an answer. They have to offer a question to one of their peers who answered a different question. Mm -hmm. And they have to read everybody's post. But I don't assess that. I say, if you do those things, you get an A. And what I do is I mon I've got one running right now. I monitor it. So but I don't control it. So I come mm -hmm. in, I go, good question, interesting comment, or I ask a question, but not of everybody. I just show them that I'm in it just as they are in it. And I found mm -hmm. that it worked so much better. And it's so much less work for me because I burnt myself out that first semester trying to like, like in class, mm -hmm. I would ask a question and I talk to them, but I can't do that like all day long in D2L discussions. It's just too much work yeah it's exhausting uh, for you yes exactly and I, I assume for them but again I got resentment even though I was saying nice things about them it just felt like I think they felt they were being micromanaged and so I don't do that in class I don't go that's an interesting comment it's a, a nine out of ten you know mm -hmm. I don't do that in class it's a judgment free zone so I thought I think D2L discussion should be a judgment free zone as long as you engage in the activity and that's set to a larger goal of the class. I find that students enjoy it, or at least they're not resentful. Maybe they're not enjoying it. That's too much. <laughs> they're enjoying it. And that's awesome. And, and that's exactly the point is what is the grade for? Why are we putting that kind of grade or assessment onto um, discussions and how can we look at that in a different way to help create that com community and save ourselves from having to really spend a hundred thousand words, I think is what you said, which is a lot. <laughs> That's a lot. Um, so yeah. Um, any other questions before I move to the next topic? Got any? There was also a question I, and I don't know if uh, Anne asked, you know, it's not just always about engagement, but looking at critical reasoning and some of those problem solving abilities and how do you see those evidence and how, how could a group help, uh, group set up help with that and covering that as well? Oh, I think that we actually will hit that with this next one um, a little bit, at least in part. Um, so the, the next thing about the, the why groups are so helpful, um, especially in um, the courses is because it does allow for a smaller community to provide comfort for students to really focus on application of information, that critical reasoning, that synthesis of things. It gives them a smaller place for that. So it tends to make them feel a little bit safer. Um, and then within that, it also really emphasizes looking at things in terms of cultural awareness and perspective, um, and then diversity and equity and inclusion, um, thinking about that in a group. So if you have, again, back to our 80 people, if you have 80 people, after the first time that there's a discussion, you're probably going to go back to the same people. Um, students tend to go back to the same people over and over and over again because they developed comfort with them in the very beginning. And if you notice in situations like that, um, 
their conversations as a semester or term progress, get a little bit deeper, get a little bit more engaged because they actually start setting up that relationship. If you have that smaller group to begin with, then they can get to that comfort level faster and it takes them to a different level of critical thought. Um, and that also, if you're able to have those prompts within a discussion or prompts within um, a, a group project or whatever, um, you are still able to prompt to that level of critical thinking, but instead of it being in one 200 word response, it's throughout a thread of conversation. It's more about conversation and less about how are you at, at taking this information and making it be 200 words. It's about conversation and communication. And it gives those greater opportunities for students to learn from each other's perspectives, especially if throughout the semester, you change your groups up a little bit. Now, it takes a while to set up some groups. I'm not going to lie. That takes a minute. So I'm not sure that it's in your best interest to change them every single module. Um, and, not, and changing them every module kind of is counterintuitive to the whole we build relationships with each other. Um, so changing them two, maybe three times in a semester, I think is probably what's going to be best because then they build that relationship with more people. Um, and then have that greater perspective. But if we are only looking at the same two or three students um, or the same two or three classmates, every time we go into a discussion board, we are missing perspective. We're missing someone else's cultural experiences. We're missing what other people see in terms of how the information from the course is impacting them and their own experiences and their own engagement and, and their own critical reasoning. Um, so really opening that up does give us a greater level of critical thought because when somebody challenges us um, to what we see in something, that's what takes us to that next level of critical thought. That's what takes us to that next level of synthesis. And you're much more likely to, and, and I don't even know if this challenge is the right word necessarily, but we're much more unlikely more, much more likely to engage with each other and push each other if we're in a smaller group and we're not quite so overwhelmed, whether that be somebody who is as super extroverted as I am or someone who's very introverted. It really gives them that safer space if it is a smaller group because 80 people is overwhelming. 25 people can even be overwhelming um, and giving them that smaller space does allow for the freer sharing of information. Uh, of course, you have to be really upfront about expectations in these group discussion boards or group projects, um, about um, cultural awareness and what you're saying and how things that you're saying can be taken. Um, so you gotta be really upfront about that stuff and you gotta make sure that people are aware, uh, but really it creates that opportunity for them to see things differently, which just takes that to the next level. Um, did that help? answer that, Anne, a little bit. Okay. Um, okay, so the next one, we've talked about this kind of throughout, um, but I just wanted to get down to here. Um, and then we've mentioned, so um, book groups, you can do book groups. Um, we've mentioned group presentations. We've mentioned group discussion boards. Um, we have mentioned uh, case studies and roles and things within case studies that would also work with like um, any kind of role play activities, um, simulation activities, um, depending on what it is that you teach. Um, and group presentations could be, um, when you're thinking about group presentations, that could be um, a piece of work. It could be an actual presentation, it, anything that you need within what are the expectations for your course's learning objectives? Um, what are some things that you all have used as groups in online or have you? But do y'all have any that you feel comfortable sharing that you've done group experiences in online? I'll just sit here. <laughs> We're here to learn from you, Kim. <laughs> Well, I've already given you a million, haven't I? Um, <laughs> um, so I think I've probably touched on a lot of them. Um, are any of the ones that I've talked about 
ones that y'all might be interested in or ones that you would like some more information about how to go about them. Well, I've never done it, never tried. <laughs> I figured, yeah, so that's what we're here for. You want all of it. Um, absolutely, and we can share that. We will put together some of our information um, and we can get it to Sheila for her to send out to everybody that's registered um, about how we do some of these things, um, including, um, our peer evaluations, some of those rubrics that we have, um, directions on how to set up roles um, so that if students are in a group, they each have a role. Um, and, and truly, some of these things will function slightly differently based on the course and the expectations of the outcome. If you are teaching a doctoral course, you're probably going to have slightly different outcomes um, and expectations than if you're teaching um, a first semester freshman general education course, but the concepts behind it are going to be the same, and it's about creating those opportunities for students to engage with each other in a way that they're not functioning in a silo in kind of a correspondency kind of situation. Um, it really is about creating that opportunity for them to interact with each other and with you uh, in a way that's much more manageable for you. Um, so we'll put all of that stuff together. I just didn't know if anybody had any that that you tried and that were awesomely successful or if you feel like sharing ones that you tried that were less successful I don't know about y'all I've done some things in my classes and I'm like this is so awesome and then you try it and it's the biggest failure ever um I'm sure none of y'all have ever had that happen so never just me um okay so we'll put that stuff together for you um and then, so the last part of what we're going to talk about um, is the how in the world do we build these things in D2L and how do we make it work? So this is, some of you, this is probably what you're here for is to how do we make this happen? So as is the norm with me, um, I, I will tell y'all to, uh, I'm going to stop sharing for just a second just because it's easier for me, but I'm going to tell y'all that you can minimize me down in the corner um, and I will pull up my D2L and then share again. Um, and Karen just put our group's cheat sheet into the chat. I would encourage you to download that um, and keep that for yourself because it really does actually walk you through the steps on how to create groups. Um, but there are a couple that I wanna show y'all specifically within discussions and grading because that one's kind of strange and how it's set up. And this is the one, Dave, that I think I left the step out. Um, because it was December and it's hard in December to, to think and do things. Um, so I will now share my D2O. Okay. Sharing. Make this full, make this bigger so y'all can actually see it. Okay. Um, so within any class, and again, as always, I would encourage you to be in a, um, a development shell or like if you have a, a sandbox or something you can do it in an active class um, just make sure when we set it up initially that it's hidden um, so that your students don't have a come apart that you're adding something to their class um, so I'm going to show you how to do one in one of my development shells I have a lot of stuff on my grants and all kinds of stuff um, so within a course Anytime you're going to set up groups, you actually want to start with setting up the group. So if you already have the activity in your course, um, like the assessment within your course, okay, um, I keep it there only because it'll be easier to copy and paste the content later. It really does behave better. Um, I like I give D2L its own personality and behavior traits. It behaves better if you create the assessment when you are creating the group. You can go back in later and tie a group to an already established assessment. Um, and that works okay with drop boxes and stuff, but it, it just isn't as nice with discussions because of some of the strange behind the scenes coding things that have to happen. Um, and I would explain all those things to you if I had even a little bit of a background in IT, but my background's in curriculum. Um, so I, I don't know how that stuff works. Um, so to set up a group and, and I'll show you an example of how to set up a group that is groups for group grading in discussion, because this is like the strangest one. So I'm going to start here. Um, 
the cheat sheet will probably show you some other things. So groups are under communication. You will go to group and then we will and and go ahead and again, minimize me down in the corner and open your D2L and go along with me. And if I'm going too fast, just tell me and I'll slow down. Um, go to new category. And then we're gonna give it our category name. And this is gonna be our example for group grading. Um, and it's up to you whether or not you put a description here. This is your group name, not your discussion itself. Um, so this is, that's all this is. So it's up to you whether or not you want to do that. Um, so for the purposes of this example, um, I'm going to briefly go through the different enrollment types. So I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time doing that. So number of groups, no honor enrollment means that you are setting up the number of groups and then you're going to manually assign people. Um, this is great if you know the people in your class um, and you know how you want to, to set that up. Um, it also takes a really long time if you have 80 people in your class. So if you have a large class, I'm going to just go ahead and encourage you to walk away from the no auto enrollment because it will take you a while to go through and do it. Um, just let D2L randomize it. Um, groups of number means it is you you determine how big each group is going to be. So if you want each group to have 10 people in it, but you don't really know how many people are going to be in your class, then set that one up. If you know that you want to have 10 groups, then you set up 10 groups and then you let D2L assign, um, auto assign evenly throughout the groups, the students in the class. Um, groups of number self-enrollment. So I'm a I'm a big fan of the self-enrollments. Um, it lets students make some choices in those. Um, I, however, don't do those. If I do groups within discussion boards, I don't do self-enrollments in those. I'll, I do the auto-enroll so that they are randomly assigned. And the self-enroll, that is for group projects that there are specific topics or concepts that they're going to be covering that they get to choose the one that they want to do. Now, sometimes that is, um, based on when during the semester a project might be due because you're tying that project to when in the semester it is that we're talking about that concept. Sometimes it's that um, these are the concepts that I really want us to be covering this semester that I want y'all to be doing your presentations on. So you get to go pick. Um, for, for an example of that, in one of the classes, um, I teach instructional design classes shocking I know um I teach instructional design classes so one of my group projects is actually on different instructional design models um, that they go out and they look at a model and then they actually present that model to their classmates um, so we end up covering a lot more models but it's in a much more engaging way than just listening to me or um, reading an article or reading a textbook or um going out and every individual going out and researching all of those models and all the information, they get to watch a different group present on it and they get the basic gist um, of what that model is about. So I know that that's what I want them to do. So when I set my groups up, I set my groups up based on what are the models that I want them to go out and research because there's a gazillion, but I try to keep it focused on what are the primary ones within online instructional design. So they get to go in and they get to self-enroll on the topic that they want to do their study on. And that's how their group gets created. They get that choice. It's learner choice. It's their active learning opportunity to engage in their own knowledge acquisition. Um, so that's what I use self-enrollments for. Uh, I have seen it done that it's based on dates um, within the class. Like, um, for example, if we were a history class and we were we're going through things chronologically within our course, typically the case within survey history class. It's very chronological. Um, and you want to have students doing presentations on um, topics at various stages throughout the semester. Students can go in and sign up for the topic based on when it's going to be presented because you're going to have students that want to do their presentation the fourth week of the semester and you're going to have students that want to do their presentation the 14th. Um, so kind of giving them that there's some that probably want to do it like the 18th, but we don't actually have that many. Um, so 
doing it chronologically throughout the semester also gives the students that choice as to when they're going to do it. And that kind of helps a little bit too, especially if you have individuals that they know that they have something coming up at this other part during the semester, they get to choose to get this thing knocked out before all the other major projects or things like that are due at the end of the semester. They can kind of space things out on their own uh, and make some of those decisions. So sometimes the group ends up happening because they just want it on that date or the presentation date is their birthday and they don't want to do a presentation on their birthday. Um, whatever reason that they choose a date is the reason they choose a date. Um, so that's what those self enrollments are. And they're, they're the same. Um, it's the same as the above ones so that it's the number of groups um, or the, the capacity. Um, and this one actually is both. So it's the number of groups and they can't be larger than um, and then it's self enrollment. So you don't end up with one group that has 10 and one group that has two. So it, it sets that capacity for you that way. Um, and then single user and member specific group. That one is um, if you are wanting to, these are great, especially in um, some smaller classes, if you have something like um, independent study or um, a project-based class or something like that, that students are doing a lot of the information on their own, you can actually set up single member groups where you and that student can communicate in a D2L discussion board. They can post their, um, their articles, they can post drafts of their work right there in the discussion board and you and that student are the only people that see it. Um, so it keeps it there and then you don't end up with 9 million emails that you're having to go through or um, all the other things. It's just right there and you can go back and review all of it. Um, all in one place so that you can be like refer to when we talked about this in module two um, this was our feedback I still don't see it and we're in module eight what what's going on here instead of going back to you searching your email to figure out when it was you sent that student an email on whatever that topic was it's right there so it it's really keeping things more concise for you um, so for this activity I'm going to go with the number of groups I'm going to say that we're going to have five groups. Um, oops, I did groups of number, even though I said, mm -mm, y'all struggle. Five groups. Hey, Kim, can I, yes. can I break in and ask a question? Yeah. On the, on the self-enrollment groups, are there, are any of those choices going to keep the groups the same size as they self-enroll? So one group can't balloon up to 10 before any of the other groups get uh, any assignment or any enrollments on them? Uh, no, um, but the, if you set the number of groups and the capacity, it can't get bigger than a certain number. Um, how is that different than number of um, groups of number self-enrollment? How is that one any different than number of groups capacity of number? Um, because D2L wanted to have a third option. Okay. Good answer. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's really, um, it, it, the, the capacity, I mean, it basically is the same thing. Okay, um, yeah, it's, okay. yeah, it's not, it, there's some really subtle differences, but it's not enough to, it's really just because they're like, oh, let's do it this way. Um, okay, thank you. It's not a big difference at all. Um, it's a first come, first serve on all of those. Is that right? Yeah, it is. It is. Yeah, if one fills, they, they go to the next one. That's just how that one goes. Um, um, Okay, so we're going to say we're going to have five groups. Um, you can give it a prefix if you want to. Um, it, it'll auto pick the one from above. Um, I am going to randomize my users because I'm using the, it auto enrolls. Um, I'm going to auto enroll new users. So this is fantastic if um, four or five days into the semester, somebody that was purged gets added back into your class and they weren't auto on the first day, it'll put them back in when they get populated into the class. Um, and then it's up to you whether or not you want to make the descriptions available. Um, it's just, it's up to you. If you put something into that description, then you need to make it visible. If you didn't put anything in the description, you don't need to make it visible. Okay, and then I'm gonna set up discussion. Um, we can actually do both from here if we wanted to, so I can actually show you both. Um, if y'all would like. Um, so, and I'm gonna use 
the course discussions forum because there's no reason for me to set up a new forum. Um, and then we're going to create a new topic. So this is where I said it's easier if you don't, if you're not trying to attach it to something that already exists, it's just a little bit easier. So if you already have that forum and you want to try it, keep that forum because that's where you're going to copy paste things from because um, there's no reason for us to rewrite anything. Um, so we're going to create that a uh, new topic from here. And then I'm gonna set up drop boxes that are a file submission. Your other options are text submission, um, observe in person or paper submission. So um, file submission, because I'm gonna allow them to actually upload something. Um, and then I'm gonna save and it's gonna take me to a, a new page and ask me all kinds of questions about what I want. So the one that you want to be able to do the grading as a group, is the create one topic with threads separated by group. And then this is my title and then my description. And you can always edit these descriptions later once it's in the discussion. Um, so I'm just putting things in just so that there's words so that you can see it later. Um, and then I'm gonna create next. And this is my Dropbox because I said we could create both at the same time so you can see them. Um, and then you'll notice that this is the part you want to make sure on the Dropbox that it has group assignment because that's what gives them one grade for the group. Uh, again, it's the type. You decide whether or not you want it to be multiple or one file. All submissions kept. The same things that you normally go through and look at anytime you're setting up a Dropbox. It's all the same. We can go ahead and set um, our evaluations here if we want to. Um, that is not required for this to get added, um, but we'll go ahead and do one. I bet there's something in here I can add to it. There's not, we'll just create one. All right, so we've created this one. It now exists, so we're gonna create. And it says that no forms were created, um, but one topic was created and one Dropbox folder was created. So we're gonna take a look, um, and I know it's coming up on 11, so if anybody has to sneak out, I promise I'm almost done. Um, so we're gonna save these, because now they exist and they're there and life is good and we have these groups. So we're gonna take a look real quick. Um, our discussion, I mean, our Dropbox now exists. Um, it's this one right here. It has the cute little group symbol on it um, that tells us that I assigned a group to it. And we're gonna look at the discussion one as well. And the reason, and Dave, this is where I think I may have missed that step for you. So this one is the example for group grading, group discussion. Um, when students start posting in this, um, it will be broken down by groups. Um, and you'll, you can change your views so that you see individual groups or all threads. Um, but that's part of one of the things that makes it easier for you too, because then you can do it so that you are only looking at the threads of one group at one time. Instead of scrolling through 80, you are scrolling through five. Um, so that is just a little bit easier for you um, in terms of how yeah. things look. Yeah. Um, if you say maybe didn't make your group discussion post this way like maybe you attached it to existing ones sure. can you still change your views like that so you can see it yes. by by groups yeah. okay cool yeah Thanks. you can it's up at the top where it says all threads where it says view all threads um you can change okay. it to groups um okay, and you'll cool. be able to view it that way um so this is now our discussion um it now exists as a discussion this is where the all groups and the all threads is located so if you don't want to view them all, you simply click on the one that is one, um, and that will take you to that specific environment um, for you to see it. So the point, Dave, that we, um, it's this one, I think. Um, so if we click on this one and we go to enter grades, 
this is this is where the user's option is. So where I said, um, make sure that you go here. So if you are looking at it as user, it would list every individual student. If you change that to groups, then you get to choose the group that you want to grade. Um, that's where the group grading happens on a discussion board is that you need to make sure that under users, you set it as the group instead of users. Sorry, Dave. Um, so <laughs> I'm pretty sure that's what it was. Uh, so that's what that one is. Um, so I know it's 11 and y'all probably have places to go. Um, so I hope that that was helpful for y'all. Um, I'm gonna stop my share. Um, and we'll be here for a little bit if y'all have some questions, since I know we got to the right at the end of time, because I had a lot to say. Um, but we will make sure to send out these resources to y'all. Um, and we're here if anybody needs anything. So I'm going to stop my recording now. <laughs>